Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about cervicogenic dizziness. So cervicogenic dizziness is the presence of imbalance, unsteadiness, disorientation, neck pain, limited cervical range of motion, and may be accompanied by a headache. And the key here is all other causes of dizziness have been ruled out. This means that cervicogenic dizziness is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to rule out or exclude other potential contributors to dizziness, like a central deficit or a peripheral hypofunction or BPPV. Those need to be ruled out. And when you've got nothing left except for cervicogenic dizziness, then you may attack the condition as cervicogenic dizziness. But we will get to the diagnosis in more detail in just a few minutes. Now with cervicogenic dizziness, the dizziness itself is closely related to changes in either the position of the neck or movement of the neck. And a lot of cases of cervicogenic dizziness are diagnosed after some kind of acute trauma to the neck. It could be whiplash following a motor vehicle accident, or it could just be in general inflammatory or degenerative changes to the cervical spine. And what's deep in the neck near the joints themselves? Well, there's small, deep neck muscles that, in addition to serving as postural muscles, they're also important for proprioception. And so these two facts right here suggest that cervicogenic dizziness at its root is really an issue with cervical proprioception. And that's actually the leading theory as to what causes cervicogenic dizziness. And so the most accepted mechanism for cervicogenic dizziness is a mismatch between visual and cervical proprioceptive inputs to the brain. And so in cases where there's significant joint restrictions, hypertonicity of the cervical paraspinals, just basically they're tight or they have high tone, significant paraspinal weakness, and other related things, especially when those things are in the upper cervical spine, the afferent proprioceptive signals that are going to the brain, specifically the cerebellum, may be inaccurate. And so an example of how this might manifest would be if you actually rotated your neck 45 degrees to the right, let's say, and you had significant tightness, let's say, in some of those deep neck flexor muscles that you see right here. Well, some of them serve a major proprioceptive function, and they may only be able to detect 35 degrees of right rotation, when in reality, there's 45 degrees of rotation. And we'll assume that your eyes are good, and if your eyes are open, they would be able to detect that your neck is rotated 45 degrees. However, those cervical proprioceptors are only detecting 35 degrees of right rotation. And so now you have a mismatch or conflicting information going to the brain between the proprioceptive system and the visual system, and that causes dizziness. It's a very similar concept to a vestibular hypofunction, except in that case, it's a mismatch between visual and vestibular input. Here, it's a mismatch between visual and proprioceptive input, specifically proprioceptive input coming from these deep neck flexor, and in some cases, deep neck extensor muscles on the other side. And that produces dizziness. There was a review article that was published by these people right here titled, How to Diagnose Cervicogenic Dizziness. And I thought of making my own diagram here, but to be honest, this one is done very well, so I just put it in there. And I'll put a link to this PDF in the description of this video. Now, before we get into the details here, there's a few important things to understand about the diagnosis of cervicogenic dizziness. The first is there has to be dizziness, right? That seems trivial, but if there's no dizziness, it can't be cervicogenic dizziness. It has to be something else. Also, there better be a cervical spine pathology. Okay? It doesn't have to be something serious like a radiculopathy or it doesn't have to be whiplash. It could be as simple as they just have a range of motion deficit in one direction or a few directions. That's all it has to be. But the fact that it's cervicogenic dizziness means that there has to be something cervical in origin that's causing the dizziness. If both of these are not present, then cervicogenic dizziness is very unlikely as it shows right here. The other important thing to understand is that, as I mentioned before, this is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning you have to first rule out the other potential causes of dizziness or anything that would preclude therapy. 
Next, you're going to screen for red flags that may preclude therapy. Using the Canadian C-spine rules, you might find a neck or other spinal fracture. Maybe there's signs or symptoms of cancer. It could be a number of things. In those cases, you would refer the person out. Uh, you might also conduct a neurological screen, dermatomes, myotomes, reflexes, cranial nerves. If they have a positive neurological screen, it's a referral if it's out of the scope of PT practice. Now, if it's a radiculopathy, PTs can treat radiculopathies. That's not necessarily a referral out, but that would come from a positive neuro screen. Okay, so you have to make a decision there. But again, if it's something that is dangerous to the person's health or safety, it is something that you refer out for. Then you can proceed to the vestibular assessment where you would perform a vestibular ocular motor screen. The first part of that, you're going to screen for central deficits or signs of a central disorder. And some tests that might be helpful there would be a positive smooth pursuit test, convergence tests, saccade tests, VOR cancellation tests. When any of these tests are positive, it rules up the likelihood that you have a central deficit. In some cases, a central deficit may require a referral, and that's if the reason is unknown. So let's suppose you have a patient who has no history of a stroke, no past history of a concussion or any kind of trauma to the head or the neck. There's nothing that you are aware of or they are aware of that could cause a central deficit. In that case, you'd want to refer out. But if somebody already had a stroke and they're in rehab and they present with some of these tests being positive, well, they already had a stroke, right? So that's not a reason for referral. You would actually expect some of these to be positive in that case. But again, you screen for the central deficits. Assuming that these are all negative, the next part of the screen has you look at the potential for peripheral deficits. So you then might do a head thrust test. A positive head thrust test rules up a peripheral deficit, also called a peripheral hypofunction. And if that test is positive, then you would treat as a peripheral hypofunction. And let's suppose that you're treating as a peripheral hypofunction and the condition gets better. Well, is there any reason to change the treatment approach? No, you're going to continue treating as a peripheral hypofunction, and it probably is a peripheral hypofunction. Now, there's always a chance that you're doing the vestibulo ocular motor screen, and it suggests the patient has a peripheral deficit. Maybe they had a positive head thrust test. And you go and you treat as a peripheral hypofunction, but the patient doesn't make any gains. They're not getting better. There is no effect from that type of treatment. And you've done the dix hull pike test, the horizontal roll test. There's no evidence that they have BPPV. There's no evidence they have a central dysfunction. There's no evidence they have a peripheral hypofunction. In that case, you're going to move on and assume that it's not the vestibular system. So you're going to do a detailed cervical and thoracic examination. By thoracic, I mean upper thoracic, because it is always possible that the upper thoracic spine can cause other things in the neck. Remember, that regional interdependence, they are connected to one another. In any case, you're going to do a detailed examination of this part of the spine. Why? Because we've ruled out that it's vestibular. Either the tests indicated it's not vestibular, the treatments for vestibular didn't work, it's not vestibular in any case. It's most likely coming from the neck. It's cervicogenic. That's why we're examining this part of the spine. You can even further rule up cervicogenic dizziness by performing these special tests, especially the first two, the cervical neck torsion test and the head neck differentiation tests. Now the obvious question is, why don't we just perform these tests from the start and automatically rule up cervicogenic dizziness? That's because these tests can be positive for other conditions. So if we perform them at the start, way up at the top here, the specificity would be horrendous, be terrible. But at this point, we've already ruled out the other conditions. So what we've essentially done by ruling out the other conditions is we've artificially increased the specificity of these tests. And so now that we've ruled out everything else, it's more than likely if these are positive that we have cervicogenic dizziness. And like I said, we'll be covering these tests in more detail in the next video. And so the bottom line here is that in order to reach the diagnosis of cervicogenic dizziness, you have to first exclude all other possible conditions that may be causing dizziness as we've described in this workflow right here. So in the next video, we're going to be looking at the tests for cervicogenic dizziness. And then after that, 
we'll be looking at some potential treatments for the condition. Join us then. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.